So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Taking Stock of G20 Sectoral Ambition on Decarbonizing Transport, which is jointly organized by GIZ and Agora Verkehrswende. My name is Alexander Jung. I'm the Senior Associate for New Mobility at Agora Verkehrswende, and it's my great pleasure to kick off today's webinar. Before we are um, starting with the actual webinar, um, I would like to point out a few functions in your control panel. You can um, hide the panel, which is uh, marked uh, with position number one. You can also um, switch the webinar to full screen mode, which is on position number two, and you can adjust the language um, in the webinar tool, which you can find on position number three. Um, you are muted during the presentation, um, so we kindly ask you to write your questions, remarks, or also your feedback to the report in the question window, which you can find at position number four in the control panel. If you did not uh, download uh, the G20 report before on our website, you can also find in your uh, control panel a download link um, for the file, which you can find at handouts. So coming um, to the webinar, the objective of this webinar uh, today is on the one hand to introduce you to a joint publication of GIZ and Agora Verkehrswende on the sectoral ambition in decarbonizing transport in the G20 countries which we have published for last year's COP. And on the other hand, we also want to include you in the process on how to update this report for a second edition that we will release later this year in fall. For this reason, we also included a quick poll function in this webinar, which I will introduce you um, at the end of my presentation. So after uh, my introduction, I will hand over to Daniel Bongard, who is the Senior Advisor on Transport and Climate Change at GIZ. And Daniel will present the key outcomes and the conclusions of the G20 report to you. He will be then followed by Marion Fivik, who is the founder of the consultancy Current Future. And Marion was working with us on the last year's report, and she will be also supporting us in the preparation of the second edition this year. Today, she will give you a more detailed insight into the country fact sheets that are also included in this report. And she will collect your feedback based on the quick poll tool that I'm going to introduce to you. As most of you are probably already aware of the work of GIZ, um, you might not have heard of Agora Verkehrswende before. So for this reason, I will just briefly say a few words about um, our work and give you an idea um, of who we are. So Agora Verkehrswende is still a quite young initiative um, that is founded and financed by Stiftung Mercato and the European Climate Foundation since the beginning of 2016. Our work is uh, mainly focusing on the decarbonization of the transport sector until 2050. And so also the term Verkehrswende actually translate to transforming transport. For now, we still have a stronger focus on national land-based transport in Germany, but we already carried out first projects with an international scope as the one that we introduced to you today. And we are also planning to increase our international activities within the upcoming years. So on the one hand, we work on scenarios, research, and strategies in the field of climate-friendly transport, but um, a large part of our work is also focusing on facilitating discourse and dialogue to drive climate action in the transport sector. And for this reason, we set up next to the think tank Agora Verkehrswende, a um, high-level council with, which consists of um, participants from the European Commission, the national German ministries, the federal states in Germany, um, municipalities, NGOs, the private sector, the labor union, but also research institutes. And this council meets four times a year, and it plays a crucial role in uh, giving impulses for our strategy and our projects. At the same time, the council also reflects our objective on initiating a broad multi-stakeholder process for driving climate agenda in Germany and beyond. So for more information, um, please also see our website, which is also available in English. So coming to the reason uh, why we are talking today about the G20 and their ambition in climate action and transport. As you can see here on this slide, the CO2 emissions in the transport sector are on the rise and they are continuously growing since 1990. If you look at their level today, the transport sector accounts for almost one quarter of the global energy related CO2 emissions. And even though the relative growth um, is higher in some developing countries and emerging economies, the lion's share of these transport emissions are 
coming from the G20 countries. So in total, 69% of the worldwide CO2 emissions in transport are related to the G20, equaling more than five gigatons of CO2. So the biggest responsibility for climate action is definitely in the G20 countries. And for this reason, we want to put a spotlight on them in this uh, report and also in this webinar today. So if we project now the growth in uh, transport emissions to the future, then it's quite obvious that we would not be in line with the two degree target. And we would be certainly not in line with the well below two degree target set in the Paris Climate Agreement. So only with a dramatic decrease in transport related GHG emissions, we have a chance to meet our climate target. And this means we need to step up the ambition in climate action and transport so that we can deliver on the Paris Agreement and achieve a nearly carbon-free transport system by the mid of this century. So against this background, um, we want to highlight with the report on the one hand that um, the transport sector uh, and especially the G20 are a important uh, factor in climate protection and they are the main contributor to CO2 emissions worldwide. On the other hand, we also want to summarize existing mitigation policies in the G20 countries, and we want to show where more ambition is needed to ensure that we can be in line with the uh, climate targets under the Paris Agreement. And at this point, I would also uh, like to mention and give my special thanks to REN21, the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st century, as they did a tremendous job in supporting us in reviewing the 2017 report, and they will also um, support us in drafting the second edition in this year. So thank you for that. Once again, if you did not download the report, uh, please feel free to uh, go on our website or download it from the um, uh, control panel on your right. So and before I'm heading over now to um, my colleague, Daniel Bongert, um, I would like to introduce you to our quick poll uh, tool and give you a first warm-up question. So the question is, what is your professional background? And you should be able to see the question now here in the webinar screen. So I would like to kindly ask you to select a proper answer to this question. Are you working in an NGO, in a government institution, in an international institution, for a research institute, or for any other institutes or organizations? Please uh, click on the uh, right answer, and then we should be able to immediately see the results of this poll. So the result should be coming up and uh, there we go. Yeah, so we can see uh, a lack in international institutions, but uh, a quite diverse uh, audience today. So you should be now familiar with the quick poll tool, which is coming up uh, later in this webinar again. So thank you again for joining us. And I will hand over now to Daniel. Daniel, the floor is yours. So, hello everybody. My name is Daniel Bongat. I'm ho hopefully I can now uh, turn on to the next presentation. There we go. So, at GIZ, we are working on transport and climate change uh, since 2009. And uh, we uh, engage in several countries, working with a lot of developing countries on behalf of the German government to support these countries in their efforts to uh, reduce emissions from transport. And uh, I'm very happy we had this cooperation with Agora Verkehrswende to uh, look at the G20 countries. And in the G20 countries, I think we have a good mix of industrialized countries, but also of major uh, up, um, emerging economies like China, India, or now the G20 presidency, Argentina. 
And uh, so, as Alex explained, the emissions uh, from the D20 countries are very high and they're on the rise. They are increasing uh, rapidly. So we hope that uh, through our work, we can also engage in learning from each other and understanding what others are doing in order to support countries in increasing uh, their ambition. So, as Alex has mentioned in the report, the main element really are the country fact sheets. And uh, in these country fact sheets, we have a number of information for each of the countries. However, my presentation will not go into this, but I leave it to Marion. Uh, so, I will give you a rough overview about uh, the total uh, situation in all the D20 countries. And I think this chart is uh, very important, also very impressive, that of course the bulk of the emissions comes from road transport, uh, road-based land transport, and uh, only a, may, uh, a minor share of these emissions uh, is from rail, pipeline trans transport, domestic aviation, and also aviation. However, especially international transport is also growing quickly, and uh, so that will be also an upcoming uh, issue in the future. However, in these numbers, this is uh, only partly included. So it's also important to say that uh, most of the emission growth uh, comes from the D20 countries. And uh, here we see an outstanding development uh, during the last years in China. Uh, and uh, so where there's major increases in the emerging economies. And that's also why the German government uh, finds it so important to cooperate internationally on uh, decarbonizing transport and on working on these issues internationally as every saving that could be made uh, in Germany will be, will be easily surpassed through emission increases in other emerging countries. Uh, one of the findings uh, where we are also working since quite a long time is uh, that the development of the gasoline prices uh, was uh, something where many people were also had the hope that increasing prices will make transport emissions to drop and will make uh, in, uh, increase the efficiency of the transport and reduce emissions uh, because, uh, yeah, um, so less access to oil will um, be not easily available anymore. However, as we have seen in the last five years, we cannot rely on this trend. So uh, oil prices dropped and we also see now that emissions are increasing again. Also in Germany, emissions are increasing again, but in other countries are also, which which is also due to the fact that, of course, larger cars driving more distances with cheap fuels. So there is no easy way out of increasing transport emissions. We now also had a look in the nationally determined contributions, the so-called NDCs. These are the climate plans submitted by all countries uh, prior to the Paris Agreement. And we did an analysis of the INDCs uh, in that report in order to also, to also look at uh, what's in there. We see when we look at the G20 countries that uh, only Japan has a transport related GHG reduction target, while all the other countries do not specify any sectoral uh, specific uh, issues. What we see in many NDCs is that uh, some specific mitigation actions are listed. For example, uh, fuel economy standards in the US or uh, uh, so in China, it, there's an emphasis on public transport development. However, there's some hope uh, as uh, if you look deeper into the analysis and you go beyond the NDCs, look at other sectoral strategies or sector implementation plans, then many countries have transport-related GHG reduction targets. 
Uh, in China, for example, it's an energy intensity target in the five-year plan. In Germany, we now have in our long-term climate action plan uh, for 2050, the uh, GHG emission uh, reduction target by 40 to 42% until uh, 2030. Also other countries have these targets. So there's the hope that uh, in the next round of NDCs, there can be more ambition. And I think that is uh, an important uh, message that within the NDCs, the, uh, within the Paris Agreement, these NDCs will be submitted every five years. And currently many countries already have started to review their uh, 2015 NDC in order to submit uh, a new submission by 2020 and then in 2025 we will have another round of submissions. So the idea of the Paris Agreement is to increase the ambition and uh, so that is also the so-called ambition cycle uh, that can be used for transport. Uh, this relates uh, to the fact uh, if we want to decarbonize transport, we basically have two approaches we need to follow. So on the one hand, we need the mobility transition. And this means that we have to avoid, shift and improve. Avoid means we need to avoid long distances traveled, reduce the distances and have, for example, the city uh, with short ways where easy access to shops, uh, workplaces, healthcare, and so on. Secondly, we need to shift uh, the mobility towards uh, the low carbon modes, the very efficient modes like public transport or uh, freight rail. And we also need to improve uh, quite a lot uh, the, uh, the emission intensity. So in addition to that, in order to decarbonize transport, the mobility transition alone will not be enough, but we need the energy transition in transport as well, which means we need to tackle the fuel question. And one of the key things is, of course, uh, Elena, you are somehow talking here in the webinar, something I need to consider. No, sorry. So, we need to touch uh, also the energy transition in transport, uh, which links to the fuels. And basically, electric mobility is, of course, one of the key strategies to be able to include no, more renewable energy in that uh, section. So in order to uh, assess these strategies, uh, we were uh, considering to analyze also the mitigation actions that the countries already have uh, decided on and taken on. So this is a status quo of mitigation action. And I showed two graphs. The first table here is on the mobility transition, uh, where, of course, we need greater ambition. However, it's very interesting uh, to see that within the countries, there is already an existing uh, possibility to assisting set of actions, of policies, uh, like road charges, national programs to support green logistics, national programs supporting public transport development, uh, and so on. So the only thing where we uh, have uh, identified a major lack of regulation and support was in the area of new mobility services. So, so far, in only very few of the uh, uh, G20 countries, we have this type of national level action to support new mobility here. So, however, I have to say that the fact that a policy or mitigation action is existing does not mean that it's very effective or uh, leading to very high emission reductions. So, that is a different set of analysis that might have to be tackled in more detailed studies uh, looking at very specific uh, context conditions. So coming now to the second uh, set of measures related to the energy transition in transport, we need greater ambition too. I think it's very obvious that many of the countries already have uh, fuel economy standards, for example, for light duty vehicles. Also pricing instruments 
are existing in a set in a number of countries, vehicle labeling, support for EVs and charging infrastructure, biofuel quotas, or other uh, policies supporting fuels, low carbon fuels, uh, CNG or, uh, or similar. So also here, there's one area where there's still a major lack, which is the fuel economy standards for heavy duty vehicles, where there are currently very few countries like the United States uh, that have ambitious regulation, but we need more in that area as uh, it's a very, uh, it's an area with very high increases. So um, as I've mentioned, the um, important link to the energy sector, I think that's something that we also would like to uh, focus more in the second version of the G20 study. And this second version of the G20 study uh, will further dive into the question on how to have the sector coupling and link uh, um, yeah, renewable energy into transport. Here we have analyzed uh, the G20 countries that have renewable electricity targets and uh, in order to decarbonize their electricity network. So when electrifying the fleet, we of course also have a very high need to have a clean power sector. And uh, only if this goes <coughs> hand in hand, then in the end we will be able to also decarbonize transport. And uh, to further look into that, that will be an area where we will put more emphasis on. So, however, there are also some other challenges, like, for example, the sustainability of biofuels, which is, a, which is a, uh, that it's an issue in many countries. And, of course, we will have uh, um, some concerns regarding fossil fuel subsidies, where also the G20 already is uh, considering some work in that area, but was not very successful yet. So to conclude on the overall analysis of all the countries, so I would like to come to an end and say that, first of all, we see that uh, we need to have uh, more sector GIG targets for the transport sector. Uh, I think it's very important to have that and also to guide action in the sector. And this might also be linked to the climate negotiations and the NDCs. So, of course, we have quite a number of existing measures already, but it needs to be strengthened and complemented. Uh, we need to fill the policy gaps, especially in those two areas I've mentioned yet, but also we need to become much stronger in the areas where we already have actions. And the link to the energy sector, of course, is very important. That needs to be further uh, looked into in order to really uh, explore the full potential for decarbonization. However, when uh, looking at the G20 level, then it's also a uh, very important discussion, what can the G20 do? And I think there is uh, the possibility to expand collaboration between the countries, uh, not even G20, only G20, but also beyond. But uh, learning from each other, I think, is a very important area where we need to look deeper into what have been your experiences, how can we strengthen our mitigation actions? Where can we go for that? And the Telanoa dialogue that is uh, going on uh, on next Sunday here in Bonn uh, might be an opportunity also for that exchange, but we also need the exchange further in the transport and mobility community. So uh, there's maybe also another uh, possibility that the G20 can engage further in dialogue with the industry, especially the large logistic industry, the car manufacturers, and so on. So having said this brief overview, I would like to hand over to Marion, who gives you more insights into the core element of the report, the country fact sheets. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, welcome also from my side. Um, I want to introduce um, a little bit more in detail the actual fact sheets. Um, Daniel had already presented uh, one in an overview, uh, but I want to take a step back and um, ask what 
the rationale was for developing these um, fact sheets in the way they are, uh, that you can see them now in the report. And um, the main reason and objective for these fact sheets was really to provide a, a an overview of where countries stand um, and give the reader uh, sufficient information so they have a good understanding of what is happening in the country, what are the transportation um, challenges that a country faces, how is that different from other countries, and um, where do they stand and where do they maybe even want to go as far as they have expressed um, targets or um, goals for the future in the sector. So um, it is intended to provide a, a snapshot um, and an overview to get a feeling for where does the country stand, where does it want to go, where does it, uh, and, and then that can link back to where does it need to go, um, what um, was already presented earlier where we need to increase ambition. So that is the objective of these fact sheets and that's why we've structured them the way they are. Um, they do include um, a, a large number of individual indicators. They also include information on measures that have already been implemented, as Daniel already pointed out, and information on the level of ambition, both in terms of international ambition in, in the form of the NDCs, but also national uh, ambition. Um, having said this, there are uh, quite a few caveats that we need to be aware of. As usual, with these kinds of exercises, um, information is um, scarce, uh, particularly in uh, developing countries, but not only. Um, data availability is an issue. It's either uh, not available at all, or the quality of the data is um, poor. Um, we have tried to use uh, consistent data sets that are available uh, internationally from the World Bank, from the IEA, from the International Transport Forum. Um, but of course, these are also um, have each their own issues, uh, but at least those organizations have tried to um, make sure they are uh, as consistent as possible. They do, in some cases, have um, gaps um, with related to the indicators and the countries that we were looking at. So we had to, in some cases, supplement these um, data sets with other available data from either in-country sources or other international sources. So um, you need to be aware um, that the data may not always be fully comparable between different countries. So it's always important to exactly look at uh, the data sources and, and also the years, because sometimes uh, there's only uh, data for particular years available. Uh, what makes it very difficult to go into more detail, particularly when we look at um, the measures, is that in many countries there's no or limited information available in English. Um, we have tried to uh, work around that with um, native speakers as far as we could, but there is limits to what we could do. So, um, but probably the largest caveat that um, Daniel already mentioned just now in his last slides is we do not assess um, the adequacy of the measures that um, are presented. What we did is um, we looked if a country has measures in place in a certain area, we did not assess how far these measures are really um, stringent, how uh, ambitious they are, and whether they are um, inclined to uh, deliver either national targets or international targets. Um, so that is important to keep in mind when looking at the fact sheets. So. Um, before we dive into the fact sheets, we want to actually um, ask a couple of questions from you um, regarding the format of these um, fact sheets 
currently they are only available within the overall uh, report. Um, so we would like to know from you whether you would like to or whether would you would see it uh, useful to have them available as individual country fact sheets, either in the form of a PDF document or on an online platform. And please um, complete now and we'll quickly see the result. So the majority would like to see them as uh, PDF documents or 49%, almost the majority. Um, and we had another question on the format. Um, the question was whether um, you would also like to have other products and formats of information um, that you would find useful around the kind of information that we're currently presenting in the report. Um, so if you would find it useful to have other formats, please say so now. And um, as uh, Alex also mentioned, you can always um, give us feedback in the chat function. So if there is uh, products that you would like to see that's not on this list, then um, just type it into the chat and we'll take note of that and, and process it when we revise the report. So we see there's um, some need for infographics and potentially a presentation to go with it. Thanks a lot. and. Um, We'll now dive deeper into the individual fact sheets. Um, I've taken Germany as an example because it's the country I live in and I'm most familiar with, but um, all the fact sheets have the same structure. So um, this is about um, how the structure works and, and why we've chosen to do this the way we do. I will go through each page. There's four pages in total for each country. So we've tried to condense all the information onto those four pages. And we start in the, um, on the first page with a general introduction, a short text that introduces the main features of the transport system, what makes uh, transport challenging in the country, um, uh, geographic features that are important. Um, for example, is it landlocked? Is it, um, does it have large um, uh, coastal areas that all influences the uh, transport modes and the transport challenges um, faced in the country? Also, um, some information on the overall area. Um, and population density, because that also impacts um, transport systems and how they are set up. On the uh, top right side, we then um, give a few uh, indicators related to um, the level of development of the country. We start out with the Human Development Index. And here we see a, a feature that we've tried to um, run through uh, most or many of the indicators where possible. We tried to compare the indicator value for that particular country to um, either world average or G20 average or both if it's possible, as you can see for the next indicator, which is uh, GDP per capita, where we have both the world average and the G20 average. Um, so you see where in this um, context the individual country stands. Um, and then we also have here the relative economic importance of the country in terms of the share of global GDP. Um, also on the first page we have um, two areas that are often um, drivers of um, transportation um, needs. One is the population, um, overall population, and the other one um, is the urbanization rate. So um, what is the share of urban population 
also here compared to global and, and uh, G20 average. Uh, and also looking at uh, hotspots of, of large urban um, areas above 1 million, um, because that also determines the kind of transport challenges. If I have, like, for example, Japan, which has almost two thirds of its population in large urban areas above one million, obviously the transportation challenges are different, um, particularly if combined with other kinds of indicators that we have, such as size of the country. So Australia also has a large um, uh, share of urban population uh, in urban areas above 1 million, but they have uh, obviously a much larger area, so that poses quite different transportation problems. So each individual indicator has a certain information value, but the, from our perspective, the the most value comes from having all these uh, indicators in one place that gives you really a feeling for what the situation in the country is. The last um, area in, on the first page is um, related to mobility and that is actually an area where data is an issue. Um, data situation is quite difficult for, for a lot of countries. We do not have this kind of data, but we've tried to present it where we could find it. Um, and we've supplemented uh, the data, the main data set that we've used um, with other data. So here is, is one where you really need to be careful of, of sources and, and years because they're not always comparable. We look at the um, uh, the number of um, uh, vehicles per um, 1,000 inhabitants, motor motorization rate. We look at total activity of passenger transport and freight. Um, and probably most importantly, um, how this activity um, splits up um, across the different transport modes. And here we see large differences between the countries. So um, before we go on to the next page, we want to ask from you um, which of these um, sets of uh, indicators or sets of information you find most useful for your own purpose, for your own work context. And the background for these questions is you will, I will ask the same question for each of the pages is that we're trying to see what is really the most interesting for you so we can put more focus on this in the next uh, version and um, maybe shorten elements that um, uh, users do not find useful. So. OK, that's quite helpful. Thanks a lot. Um, the second page is uh, totally um, related to emissions and the emissions profile of the country. And we start with um, total emissions and providing some context. Um, so we have um, absolute emissions in for most countries 2015. Um, and uh, the change from 1990 um, level emissions, um, that's going to be important because that shows up again in the next um, section on transport um, and the comparison can be quite enlightening. Um, and we have a short text that describes um, the development of emissions and, and major sources. We also look at per capita emissions of total emissions. Um, maybe one one um, quick um, mention that all emissions um, data is from the IEA um, CO2 emissions from fuel combustion. So that is important to keep in mind um, also when comparing the information in the fact sheets to other information that is out there in terms of um, greenhouse gas inventories or um, other data sets. Um, so um, particularly when we get to shares of certain of the sector or 
um, uh, split between uh, individual fuels. This is all based on IEA data, so um, this could be different if you're using different data sets. Um, so we're also showing here what the share in, in global emissions is from uh, the country. Then we look into um, the transport sector um, and we compare here um, what is uh, the change in transport sector emissions since 1990. And for example, in, in Germany, that's quite interesting. Total emissions have decreased by 22%. In the transport sector, we have only seen a decrease by 0.7%. So these kinds of comparisons of different indicators make this interesting. Um, we have um, the share of um, uh, transport in, in total em emissions um, and also uh, per capita emissions um, in the transport sector. And here, um, quite interesting as well, is um, the expected um, sh uh, per capita emissions from transport in 2030 under the uh, business as usual scenario. And, and that's taken from a a slow cat partnership analysis and, and I'll go into that a bit more in on the next slide. Also uh, quite important we're um, looking at transport emissions by the individual um, transport modes and as we've seen already in Dania's presentation no surprises here um, road transport is dominating. Then on this page as well what we're looking at is um, historic and projected emissions um, from the sector and the projections are taken from um, the analysis from the slow cloud um, partnership as i just mentioned they've analyzed a whole range of um, scenario exercises that were undertaken by um, a wide range of um, organizations and institutions and have consolidated this and this is the basis for this um, assessment. Um, and uh, we com then compare this to available um, quantitative greenhouse gas targets that uh, a country has set either uh, internationally in their NDC, this would be only Japan, uh, and for, but a, a range of other countries have set uh, quantitative national targets. And um, here we can see that um, the German national target uh, would actually constitute a substantial decrease from any of the business as usual scenarios that we we see. So before we go into the next page, quick uh, poll on which of those sections, well, there were only three, but um, just quickly check what you find most interesting. And then we can see the responses. Okay, so it's really the more transport sector specific part and having it all in one place. Thanks. The next page um, has three different um, elements and they're all very linked. Um, we start with energy use in the sector. Um, unfortunately, the bottom of the slide is cut off, but I think you'll get the gist. Um, here we um, have a look at um, fuel prices, um, gasoline and diesel prices in the country um, and Daniel already showed the overview and development over time. Here this is looking at the current prices and how that compares to um, the global average and the G20 average um, in, in, in the country. We also look at the um, split between different fuels um, in the transport sector um, and then we have a, um, a section that looks at the biofuels, um, not only at imports, but also on 
production, exports and imports. The uh, rationale is to really understand better how far a government is actually able to influence um, the sustainability of these biofuels. Um, assuming that it's easier to influence production that's happening in the country itself rather than imports, although obviously we know that there's also uh, to some extent um, control on imports and I'll get back to that on the last page. In the um, middle panel we have a closer look at electric vehicles. Um, here we are um, relying largely on the IEA's um, electric vehicle outlook um, supplemented with some additional data and we look at um, the absolute numbers of um, new registrations in 2016 and total stock both for um, battery and plug-in hybrids but we also look at how um, at the development uh, in 2016. So um, here in the middle you see the share of new registrations in 2016 compared to the total stock. So we see that in, in many countries um, there has been a tremendous um, increase in total stock in 2016. In Germany a, a third of the total stock um, was came from registra new registrations in that one year. But on the other hand, we also see one indicator down that the share of the electric cars in the total uh, stock is still ne negligible. Mm. We also look at the relative importance of electric vehicles in the national market, which is also still very, very low. Um, and we look at what is obviously crucial for further development at the infrastructure. So what is um, the number of publicly accessible charging infrastructure um, for slow charge and fast charge. And um, then that links back to um, what Daniel already mentioned, the energy sector and how clean is uh, the electricity production that we're using for those electric vehicles. Um, with a short description of the context and support uh, mechanisms that are in place in a country to support renewable um, electricity generation, any targets that are um, set for renewable electricity generation, and then a couple of indicators that aim at understanding um, what the current levels of renewable uh, generation is and um, what the importance of um, transport in energy consumption is at the moment, which in the case of Germany is, is really uh, small with 2.2% um, of total electricity use being used in the transport sector. Um, so that is, is trying to provide this overall, this whole page is trying to provide this whole um, link between energy use in transport, uh, further electrification, and then uh, how renewable is that electricity. So um, before we go on to the last page, very quickly, let's see which of those sections you find most interesting. Thanks, and I think we can see the result. Okay, great, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll go on with the last page, which is um, interestingly what we started out with as the question. So what is the ambition level at the international and national level. That was our original um, starting out question for the fact sheets. Um, and we here show um, as context the general NDC, so the general commitment um, submitted to the UNFCCC. Um, 
in the latest version, uh, some countries have resubmitted their uh, INDC um, at some point. Uh, we do list um, whether there is any quantitative transport related target in the NDC and um, what kinds of measures are included. Um, in the next section, we um, highlight um, any national targets that were set um, and, and in some countries, that's multiple targets in different strategies. Um, we also have a section um, related to um, some trade-offs. Um, I've already mentioned sustainability of biofuels. Um, so we look at measures that the country has put in place to um, ensure that um, biofuels used in the country are sustainable, sustainably produced. Um, and we also look at what Daniel already mentioned at subsidies. So um, what is the level of subsidies in the transport sector for fossil fuels? Um, and a, a short text on what the situation is in, um, in, uh, with respect to subsidies. Um, have some subsidies just been phased out or um, are new subsidies um, in the making? And then in the last section, we look at implementation and uh, Daniel uh, already showed the overview across all uh, 20 countries. Here, we basically look into more detail for each country. We have the same um, areas of action that we've identified, five in the mobility area and seven in the energy area. And, um, in the second column, um, we basically have a short um, description of measures that are in place. Um, and um, again, this is no evaluation of whether these measures are adequate. It's just that they target um, this area of action and they are potentially um, uh, they could potentially reduce emissions, um, but we haven't really um, assessed whether either those measures are actually um, uh, effective on the ground or whether they are even ambitious enough, even if they're effective. Um, but at least it's, it gives a starting point to see what is there. And we were quite surprised to find a lot more uh, already happening in countries than we had um, expected. Um, and um, I think it provides a good starting point for analysts to then delve deeper and, and um, look at individual um, instruments or laws or strategies in more detail and, and make this assessment in a, in a later stage. So um, this is it from my side on the on the fact sheets. So we have one more poll um, with um, a few questions. Uh, first is again on which of those um, areas you found most interesting, but we also have a, a couple of other questions that we would like to ask you. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. And we had uh, we wanted to know whether um you would find it useful to have a closer look at the national level targets. Um, we basically only provided the headlines this time. So, um, and we're considering um, providing a more detailed assessment of national level um, targets and strategies. So the question is, 
would you find that useful or not? Okay, that's pretty clear. And I think we have one final question. And that is, um, for which purposes you would use the information in the report or you have used already, for those who have already had a look at the report. Um, this can also help us to um, make sure the information is presented in a way uh, and the right kind of information is presented in a way that's most useful for you. So, Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And um, that's all from my side. And I'll hand back to Alex. Okay, thank you very much, Marion, uh, for that uh, in-depth uh, insight into the effect sheet. And also a big thanks to the audience for participating in our polls. Um, we still have a few minutes. We received some remarks, so thank you for that. But we also have some questions as far as I could follow. Um, there was one question on what does pipeline transport mean? Uh, I think here I can just simply ask, answer that uh, this refers to the transportation of um, yeah, materials or goods such as oil or natural gas through a, a pipeline. Um, but we also had two further questions, one, of the, one on the contribution of aviation in, uh, on G20 transport emissions and what is the perspective on the aviation sector and a second one on the role of mitigation measures for um, green economies and how this could potentially be translated to the transport sector. So um, maybe on aviation, Daniel, if you uh, would like to answer this question. Yeah, thank you for the question. I was still muted. Um, so aviation usually uh, is only uh, responsible for um, around 5% of emissions in the country, but this relates also to the fact that in these numbers, of course, only domestic aviation is included. So international aviation has much higher shares and uh, is uh, much more important because of the very long distances uh, these flights take and also the high increase uh, of uh, travel uh, in air, both for freight and for passenger transport. So domestic aviation is uh, certainly something that is important, uh, but it is still, in comparison to road transport, just a smaller share of emissions. Uh, international aviation, of course, is then responsible easily for 10% uh, uh, of total emissions, and this share is projected, at least in business as usual cases, to increase uh, much further. Um, as uh, the travel demand forecasts in that area are very high. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, there was a second question on the role of uh, mitigation measures and how we could potentially uh, include this in this report. Uh, Marion and Daniel, do you have any immediate uh, response to that or is this something that uh, you would like to uh, think about while working on the um, update of the 2018 report? Um. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think it would be that that question needs a little bit more thinking. So I'd rather get back to that in writing and, and we can discuss how we can reflect that uh, a bit more in the report. Um, okay, thanks a lot. I think the same accounts for another question that came in on shared mobility and how we could include this into the report. This is something that we certainly already discussed for the 2017 report. 
but since uh, empiric evidence and shared mobility, shared mobility impact is rather scarce and uh, not easily accessible, um, we decided not to emphasize it in the 2017 report. However, um, we will, I am sure we will discuss this um, this year when uh, working on the update again as shared mobility activities and services are increasing and it certainly uh, can play a major role in uh, reducing um, uh, the transport in reducing the transport volume. So this is something that uh, is already on our agenda and that we will uh, take a closer look into for the 2018 report. So I guess we are now also already past uh, 3 p.m. here in Berlin. And um, since there are no more questions, I would like to thank once again Daniel Bongard and Marion Fiewig for their interesting presentations. And of course, once again, a uh, uh, big thank you to the audience for your input and for joining this webinar. There will be a recorded version available after um, the webinar. We will provide uh, the details on that um, by email to you. There is also a short survey just after this uh, webinar with some further questions on the 2018 update of the report. Um, we would be very happy if you could um, take part in the survey and it will also give you the chance on further engaging in the process of updating the 2018 report. Um, so we would love to hear from you. Uh, reach out to us if you would like to uh, be involved in the process of updating this report. Um, uh, we will also provide our contact details um, via email. So we would love, love to hear from you. Thank you again and goodbye.